Today's episode is sponsored by Coros. Coros is the leading customer engagement platform. From social media to online communities to digital customer care, Coros helps companies authentically connect with customers. Coros connects consumer insights across departments and helps companies run their businesses with their customers, anticipating their needs and accelerating sales. Coros works with over 2,000 brands, including 52 of the interbrand 100 companies and powers over 500 million digital interactions every day. Check them out at coros.com. That's K-H-O-R-O-S dot com. Hello and welcome to the shiny new object podcast. My name is Tom Ollison. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so I have the pleasure and the privilege to get to interview our industry's leaders and this week is no different. So I'm on a call with Soumya Guttipati who is Vice President Estee Lauder global brand technology leader at the Estee Lauder Companies Incorporated. So, Salmia, could you give the audience uh, an introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure. As uh, Tom mentioned, um, I'm a vice president at Estee Lauder, so I'm responsible for all technology needs in a mini CIO capacity for the brand Estee Lauder in the company. Um, and I have a somewhat of a interesting, um, background, meaning right now I'm at the retail beauty industry. Before that, I worked at uh, NBC universal, which is a media industry. Before that I was a part of telecom at AT AT&T. So I have varied experience worked in different, different industries. Um, but my primary focus is uh, technology and how technology can help the companies. Fantastic. So it's a formulaic podcast and we always start with a few questions where we kind of get to know you a bit. So in terms of your own time, energy and money, what has been the best investment that you've made in your career? You know, (laughs) There are, of course, you know, there are a lot of aspects and especially when you live, <laughs> when you have this many years of experience and lived this many years, um, there you have spent, in, you have invested in many, case, in many different areas. But I think if I have to pick one that is the single most uh, important one in my mind is building relationships. I think this is the single most important aspect of life. The, so the relationships that you build along the way shape you to be who you become in life and help you succeed in really unexpected ways. You, you make friends today or you build, you build a few relationships in a, at a workplace or at a client location. And you may not think much about it today, but they come in... Uh, helpful ways in like several years from now that you that you never expected um, so absolutely the relationship building it's a it's a very crucial as you go up the ladder um, I feel like I've been able to navigate through various companies that I worked at which are all like big corporations with a lot of diverse uh, personnel and businesses um, the, the reason I feel like I've been successful um, is because of my build and build relationship building uh, abilities. And uh, the second important factor is also, of course, your team. And when uh, the reason I'm saying a team is the relationship uh, aspect comes with, uh, with, the, with the team as well. Um, not only, you know, relationships with your peers and uh, uh, colleagues and friends and family, they're important. And it, the, with your team is also equally important. Um, you're successful only if your team is successful. You have to make them feel good and provide them with guidance and autonomy. So they believe in what you're, uh, what you're doing. Um, so and, uh, we all see a lot of people, um, really smart people, 
uh, who put their heads down and say, you know, let me just do my work and um, that will take me wherever, right? But people that are, who are more successful focus on their interpersonal skills and relationship skills. It's the people that have a good mix of skills will be the one that end up building great careers. So, so, so how does that work in and out of work? So when you say you've invested in relationships, do you or have you typically invested in those work relationships outside of work? Is that an important part of that process or is, or is it like, no, I'm, I'm going to build relationships and develop interpersonal skills within the work environment? Um, definitely. Uh, I think it extends beyond the five o'clock or six o'clock um, when you leave the office. There definitely, I have uh, made some really good friends um, in my past, um, uh, I guess, offices uh, where I worked and I still talk to them. I still meet with them for lunch or dinner whenever um, possible. And, you know, I think that those are, have come to be very useful whenever I'm like looking for a change in career, I can go back to them and ask for an advice or ask for, Hey, can you please introduce me to so-and-so, um, or even as simple as a sharing, uh, an article, um, or, you know, introducing me to somebody else where uh, I need to, just as an example, uh, one of my um, colleagues at uh, business school or one of my classmates at business school, um, it so happened that I needed to uh, talk to his company because we wanted to do something and I could go back to him and say, hey, by the way, I'm looking for um this help um can you can you and your company help me with this uh engagement and that was uh, that came in very very handy so things of that nature you just never know and this is the guy that i met 10 years ago we were just classmates we weren't like that close friends or anything but it became extremely handy and you know so you just never know what so so if someone's listening to this podcast who doesn't have the experience that you do and they think, right, okay, yeah, I'll make a mental note. Building relationships is, is crucial and a great investment. What would you say are, the, are the, the top tips in building relationships with people at work that someone who is newer to the industry could benefit from? I think, you know, you when you talk to somebody uh, your colleagues or you just met or you met a couple of times just focus on the present like how you're talking to them and think that you know what i um want to have the relationship make that personal connection with somebody so that it lasts because when you want when you need to get things done in corporations especially in corporations startups are different but it's it's hard you got to go through so much bureaucracy and various steps and processes and all of that whereas when you have a relationship with somebody at a personal level you could just call up that person and say hey i need to get this done could you please help me and they are more likely to get that done for you um without having to go through um, you know a lot of processes and steps uh, or approval processes right um, so you, I mean, it's a, there is a bit of an art to it than science in building relationships, but just to focus on making that personal connection whenever you meet people, take interest in uh, uh, their personal life when you go to their office. If you look, what, you know, if they have any pictures in the office or any kind of uh, objects that you can say, oh, you know, that's a cute dog or, oh, how old are your kids? You know, make that personal connection uh, so that that's how you build a relationship with somebody and it grows. So that's great advice and really lovely stories there about investing in relationships. But what, what's new? What new beliefs or behaviors have you started using or believing in in the last five years or so that's really impacted your work life? Um, probably, uh, setting priorities, 
knowing what's more important is really critical. You know, when you get up in the day, you know, like every day I go through this. <laughs> Before I wake up, I'm like, oh, what do I have today? And then I, like 10 different things come to my mind when I'm just lying down on the bed thinking about the day ahead. I was like, oh, as soon as I get in, I got to do this. I got to do that. There are like 10 different things or maybe 20 different things. They're all like a number one priorities, right? But, um, and then of course, you also have personal life, like your kids and your family. Um, so knowing what's actually important for that moment, for that day, for that morning, for that evening is, um, I think is very critical. Um, so that I definitely have become better at it in the last several years than when I was much younger, because, you know, as you grow older, you have more and more responsibilities. And uh, so it becomes even more critical to prioritize um, what's in front of you. Um, and, um, you know, like, for example, uh, yes, work these days is taking more and more of your time uh, in the day. Even when you come home, you, you're still kind of have to check your email and maybe phone calls, take a few phone calls here and there. But I make it a point um, when I leave work, whatever the time may be, let's say six o'clock and I have a long commute uh, to go home, um, uh, like hour and a half. <laughs> so, um, but once I come home, I definitely make it a point to spend my time with my daughter and, um, my husband when, when he's home. Um, so I definitely ha I feel like when I'm home, I want to be with them. Um, I don't necessarily want to go out with my other friends or anything like that anymore on the weekends. I would rather be with my family because I already spend enough time at work and work friends, et cetera, during the day, during the week. Uh, so it's like that kind of priorities. When, what comes when? Um, and even within the work, how do you prioritize different tasks, uh, answering different people's questions? And how do you prioritize your family time over work? I think those are like, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so like kind of, kind of related to that, um, the how, how do you deal with that feeling of overwhelm? I'm sure you, you can lie in your bed and work on what you got to do and you can carve out time for your family, like uh, all things that I think a lot of people listening to this podcast can relate to. But when you get that feeling of like, you know, insert, expletive here but it, when it's too much and it's you're overwhelmed and you've taken on too much or just kind of kind of hit you from from you know from behind or whatever like how do you get out of that overwhelmed state what are your what are your triggers what are your tools what tips do you have for dealing with that feeling um yeah i know there are certainly some days you feel that way and uh it's yeah <laughs> so there are like during the day well, when that happens and it certainly there were certainly days when that happened to me uh i simply get up and leave and go for a walk and get some coffee and if possible if i can try and find a friend or a colleague who could just talk to me you know, about general stuff. It doesn't have to be about that issue, but like a general stuff or movies or like whatever the top, um, just general things. Uh, have a light conversation that could kind of lighten the mood and uh, make things better for you at that time. So I do that with like for a quick 10, 15 minutes, just get out of the situation and distract yourself from whatever the issue, whatever that stuff or whatever is happening at that time and go talk to a friend or a colleague get some coffee take a walk like that's one tip i have um that's nice. I definitely, yeah so, and then yeah sorry go ahead 
Sorry, I, I just, I really want to know, because we, we have to move on to the shiny new objects shortly, so sorry, but I, so I think that's a really great bit of advice. I, I like the idea around um, something that's humorous or makes light of the situation, it's got powered by coffee as well. <laughs> it is uh, <laughs> uh, not one I've heard before. Uh, but what, so that's a great bit of advice, but what other advice would you give to a student, uh, a student who's looking to get into the industry, someone who's you know, got good grades, motivated, driven, you know, doing all the basics to if someone who wanted to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them? Um, since I talked a little bit earlier, uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I just want to touch on it a bit and then move to something different. Um, you know, relationship building, how I talked about it, that's, you know, extremely important and how uh, the, definitely that would be an advice I would give to a smart driven uh, student. Uh, but beyond that, um, be persistent and be focused about what you want. That's what I tell everybody, you know, you want something, you got to be focused about it, go after it, be persistent. Uh, don't expect things to come. Um, you have to go after it. The, you are the best person that is that can shape your career, that can help yourself. Nobody would help you if you don't help yourself, right? And then the other aspect I would say is, um, sorry, it's maybe because of my background and how I grew up, but uh, technology, right? Technology has infiltrated every aspect of our life. It's changing how we communicate, consume entertainment, how we shop, how we live, so on. Um, we're in this golden age of uh, technology and it's shaping our future. And we're, uh, it's very exciting to be part of it. Uh, regardless of the vertical, which vertical you choose or which industry you choose, whether it's media, retail, beauty, healthcare, you, it doesn't matter, or marketing or um, you know, whatever field you choose, you should have some technology, basic technology background that would give you an edge. And even if it's not your major in college, you know, take some basic classes um, on technology and how it works so that you can make better decisions. When you become a leader, you know how to think about it, how to, you know, move the needle with your business. Um, I think it'll help you in the long run. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. If you love all things innovation and want to understand how brands plan to emerge stronger from the current situation, don't forget to check out Madfest London on the 11th and 12th of November. My good friend Dan at Madfest knows how to put on a cracking event and there's always plenty of amazing speakers, beer and cool people to meet. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we're going to move on now to your shiny new object. And I pushed you on this, but we, but we stuck with the same thing. And I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. But your shiny new object is artificial intelligence. As broad as that, brilliant. Uh, so I know what I think AI is, and I know you do. But could you explain to the audience what you understand artificial intelligence as being so we can use that as a foundation for our discussion? <laughs> artificial intelligence <laughs> it, well for starters it's not artificial <laughs> um it's a, a, a audience have to bear with me if i get geeky on this please um, get as geeky as, as you possibly can <laughs> The best I could try to uh, explain it as simply as I can is um, it's really taking a whole bunch of data sets uh, and applying some logic so that a computer can go through these massive, massive amounts of data and identifying the patterns. Um, uh, in that data and give you some insights onto what kind of patterns are they observing. Um, for example, the, maybe the simplest way everybody can understand it is uh, take Facebook data. Um, machines can look at um, Facebook data, like take your, your circle of friends and your Facebook feeds. And between you and your friends, you know, if a machine can actually look at all your posts and your friends' posts and what they like, what they share, 
is how if a computer can go through all of that data and say, hey, you know, in your circle of friends, um, most people love um, going to Disney. I'm just making it up here. <laughs> or they like kids-based entertainment. They seem to be liking it, maybe because they all have kids of that age. Um, so picking up, and they all love restaurants um, where family-friendly restaurants, right? Um, or they all hate crowded places. I'm just making it up. So computer can look at, the, uh, look at that data and extract these kinds of insights. And how is that possible? Through AI, because the computer can understand this data and observe those patterns and then spit it out um, the results that we humans could uh, process and do something with. Um, so, I, hope- <laughs> I think that's a, a great dis- description and, and thanks for using the Facebook example. That's, that's really clear. So why are you passionate about this? Where is it going? What is the near future of AI that really gets you thinking in a super geeky way about it? Um, you know, the AI has like so much potential, so much potential, and it's already in making a big, um, big difference in our everyday life. It's almost pervasive already in our life. For example, when you're using Alexa at home, you know, it's, it, it's, it's AI that's talking to you, that is understanding your voice and converting that into some computer commands to get you the answers that you need. Um, So it's changing the way we are living our lives, consuming our entertainment when you're watching, maybe not TV, but like, let's say Netflix um, or YouTube or any of those uh, digital media. And there is an AI engine behind it that is observing what you're watching and then giving you recommendations and and personalize your feeds. and in the mar- so maybe from the marketing point of view, I could give some examples of uh, how AI is going to if, uh, impact some of the brands. Um, so um, you know the consumers, right? They we all as consumers we shop, and not just the stores, but more and more we are shopping online. And there is a social commerce that's. Uh, uh, becoming more and more prevalent. So we are shopping in through many different ways. Um, but from a brand point of view, you should really understand the consumer 360 view uh, on where all they, how all they're shopping and what did they shop before. And uh, when they come to the store, you want to tell them, hey, by the way, based on your, uh, these, these, are the, these are the items you might like are that might actually be suitable for your um, you know, needs. Um, so you want to create that personal uh, connection with the consumer so that um, they become a little bit more loyal. So you have a deeper connection with your, uh, with your customers and you can you know, offer better services and they get excited about your product. So all of that is possible through AI if you can actually bring all of that data to see what their preferences are, what they bought, what they didn't buy, how much time did they spend looking at a particular um, sweater or a foundation or a lipstick. Um, Based on that, you can guess what they like and they don't like. And next time when they visit you, wherever it is, uh, you could actually make some suggestions and uh, provide a personalized advice. Um, a similar, and that, of, of course, also helps you um, figure out your you know, inventory and all of that so that it's quicker to respond. Um, yeah. So, so you've, there's, a, there's an ascendancy there, isn't there? So you're talking about recommendation, which would be, right, I'm on Amazon, uh, I've clicked on this, and other people who have bought this have also bought these things based on the data about my purchases and what the search is. And then personalization is that, hey, Samia, uh, we know you like this, so you're, you're definitely going to like this. So I, I think that those are uh, uses of artificial intelligence that we could all relate to. But where's it going to go? Like, what, what is the ascendancy here? So we move from recommendation to personalization. It, 
is it predictive commerce? Are we are we going to get care packages from different brands full of stuff that we haven't even seen or clicked on before? Where, where do you see artificial intelligence taking the consumer experience? Um, I think it's going to um, make it much more efficient. Definitely predictive models uh, are... Um, becoming more and more popular, more companies are investing to come up with the predictive models for their businesses. Uh, but in terms of from the consumer point of view, you know, there is a line that you uh, want to draw, right? You don't want to make it creepy by <laughs> uh, knowing too much about a consumer and then suggesting because you did this, you know, you should do that. You don't want to do that, so you got to be careful there. Um, and I think uh, so. Uh, when it comes to predictive models, the way I see it, at least you know, in some of the industries that I'm familiar with, whether it be beauty or even media industry, the way I see it's going is um, it, like predicting the trends, so that you can create a product. Uh, that w- that consumers most likely would want in future. Not a, may not be one particular customer, but in general as a trend. Um, for example, um, I'm just making it up here. Um, in lipstick, these are the colors that are going to be trendy in m- people are going to like in fall, come upcoming fall or spring. You know what? If we have that kind of a predictive data, we as a company could. Um, make those, um, be prepared for, um, with those. Like, for example, when I worked at NBC, um, so some of the things that we were thinking about is uh, if we have, what would consumers like year from now? What kind of content can we make using this data? So if you know what consumers like, what, the, what, my, what they might like in future based on various aspects, right? Um, so you can actually create a particular show with this type of an actor or this type of a storyline, um, uh, that type of thing. It, just as an example, going back 10 years ago, you know, reality shows were becoming very popular. Um, but I think people knew it only after first a couple of shows that became really popular. That's when everybody caught up and making reality shows. But if only uh, the company that knew ahead of time that, you know what, this is what the consumer preferences are going, this is what will make, uh, will sell uh, year from now, I think, you know, it would be a better investment uh, for the company. So I think those are the types of things where companies are going to take advantage of uh, when it comes to AI. So two things leap out for me there. I'd I'd love to get your view on both of them. So the first one was brands need to understand where the creepy line is, like what's too much personalization, what's too much prediction. Now, is that an age thing, right? So in the same way that uh, my daughter's grown up, like she's being part raised by Alexa as we speak, right? And so she's never going to think, she's never going to go, ooh, voice tech, that's really interesting. It's it's just there. Um. (laughs) Do you think it will be the same for her generation where like ramp and personalization and prediction, if it's just there, she won't find that creepy. Is this idea that there's a, a line that the creepy line exists because we remember a time when it wasn't there or will it always feel creepy no matter how old you are? Um, that's an interesting <laughs> uh, way to look at things. Yeah. You know, I feel like there is a, generation right for example maybe our generation um, like my generation um we growing up we didn't have facebook we didn't have all of these so we kind of learn um as we as these were introduced um so because of that we are careful and we're not that kind of you know that type of thing and then you have the millennial generation where the these kinds of things whether it be alexa or facebook these were introduced while they were teenage years or uh, something like that where they didn't know the good and the bad and that comes with all of these tools Um, so it has become almost like an experimentation and whereas your daughter or my daughter for example they 
are familiar with Alexa, they know all the social media tools and they know all of these things. I feel like they are um, growing up knowing both the good and the bad coming from these. I think that they are a much more careful generation in um, understanding where to draw the line um, and how far they can go or they cannot go. I definitely see it with my daughter. She um, is very extremely careful about posting information or using a certain media channel um, with the personal information. I think same with Alexa too. I, I think this new generation, the current kids generation are much smarter about these. Uh, and so yeah. another point I wanted to pick up on is you saying that uh, predictive shopping might be a bit weird and it goes on that beyond the creepy line. But you said also that companies that have the right data or have enough data could start to create products based on uh, data points and use a lip, lipstick example as a as just as a, a, a creative idea but as a technologist where does where does technology really support and where does human intuition and media budget kick in and what i mean by that is that if estee lauder for example uh, released a product um, and this is just talking completely hypothetically. Um, and it, you said, right, it's coming out in these three colors. And because of your media weight and the amount of impressions you can deliver, then actually in some ways that defines culture. And that's what, that's what large brands are able to do. They're able to create want and demand and trends off, off their own backs. I'm not completely always, and it's not always successful, but how, how do you theoretically tread the line between using data to inform product development, ad development, creative ideas, and actually, do you know what, just good old fashioned ideas from a human being with loads of media spend behind it. Like how, what, how do you see the relationship between those two things? You know, as much as uh, we all love uh, data and AI giving us insights, I still see a big uh, need for human involvement. AI is not going to uh, replace some of the human judgment. You know, <laughs> so uh, the, this is one reason I, when I think about AI, I say it excites me and scares me at the same time, right? Like when Elon Musk talks about uh, basic, basic income and as, as robots are going to take over the world, that scares me a bit. But I don't think that's anytime soon. I think at least in the near future, when I say near future, I'm talking like next 10, 20 years kind of a thing. Um, there is, um, I see machines and humans working together that creates efficiencies and enhance user experiences and all that, all that kind of stuff. So yes, I think uh, humans will actually make the decision, but informed by the machine um, with AI behind it. That's how I see it. I think human judgment still plays a major role. At the end of the day, the connections that we have, we make with each other, they play a major role. You tied that you tied that together so beautifully. You started this conversation talking about relationships, and that's been the most valuable <laughs> investment of your time. And we're going all the way through to artificial intelligence, and actually, the, 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 what a lovely way to finish it. That the, the, it's human connection and need and relationships are, are, are crucial and aren't going to be uh, got rid of by the robots anytime soon. And unfortunately, we've got to leave it there. Salmia, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for sharing your time. Uh, we're both on on lockdown as it as it stands, so um, it was it was great to really make use of that. So, if someone was excited by your ideas and really wanted to reach out, how would you like them to do that? Uh, they can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm generally good at uh, responding on LinkedIn. It might be delayed by a day or two, but I, yeah, I think that's probably the best way. And what makes a brilliant reach out to you on LinkedIn? Um, <laughs> just why you want to connect with me. I think just to give that explanation why you want to connect with me, I think that helps me. Great.
Okay, that's excellent advice too. Samia, thank you so much. Thank you. This is, thanks for this great opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Hi, just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.com. Net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.